and welcome to the Complete Health Podcast, the podcast that brings you a complete view of everything healthcare, exercises, medicine, and much more. We're your hosts, Helen O'Leary and Reese Noble, both physiotherapists at Complete Physio and Pilates in London. This is episode 13, the first of our three-part chat with psychotherapist Donovan Pyle. This is a jam-packed episode where Donovan explains to us exactly what cognitive behavioral therapy is and how he uses it with a wide range of people, from elite athletes all the way through to city bankers. Importantly for us, Donovan goes deep into the link between psychological stress and pain and injuries, and how cognitive behavioural therapy can help this. We got quite excited with this chat, so all three episodes are continuations from each other. So please keep an eye out in coming weeks for part two of this wonderful conversation. Hello and welcome everyone to episode 13 of the Complete Health Podcast. I'm lucky for some. Yes, indeed. Good time to have the uh, psychotherapist in, I think. <laughs> so, I am Reese Noble. I am your host. I'm one of the physios here at Complete Physio. And as always, I am here with my wonderful co host, Helen O'Leary. Hello. Lovely to have you here again, Helen. Thank you. And today we have a very, very special guest who is psychotherapist Donovan Pyle. Donovan, thank you for being here with us. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> Excellent. And they got me a cookie. Oh, yeah. <laughs> cookie really and coffee. And I stocked up on coffee. We're <laughs> <laughs> keeping him up, definitely. <laughs> so, we've got Donovan in today because um, a big part of physiotherapy and uh, any, I guess, fit, any, any fitness, anything like that, is we're not just dealing with people in a mechanical sense. People aren't just bones and muscles. They're not a car. They're not just not, not just nuts and bolts. There's you know a wonderful array of thoughts and feelings and emotions and everything else that go along with that. And what we all know as physiotherapists is they can have massive effects on outcomes of injuries. They can in some cases be a majority cause of injuries or pain in particular, particularly with chronic pain and things yeah. like that. So we really wanted to get uh, Donovan along to give us some insights into those things and and give uh, the listeners out there, for physiotherapy or any therapist for that matter, and patients some tips, tricks, ideas in identifying these things and potentially dealing with them. Yeah. Excellent. So, thank you very much for being here. We are really looking forward to it. Before we jump into it too much, a bit of an elevator pitch of you. Who is Donovan Pyle? How did you get into what you do? Good question. Uh, so, I've been doing this, I've been working as a psychotherapist for about 16, 17 years. Wow. Uh, primarily started in the addiction world. Since then, I moved into private practice about 2006, so mainly working in the city. Lots of stressed out lawyers and bankers. Uh, and then in addition to that, about 10 years ago, I uh, did a master's in sports psychology. So sports psychology is about 10% of my practice and then 90% is about clinical practice, treating patients with anxiety, depression, yep. disorders, PTSD, couples, et cetera, et cetera. So anything and everything to do with uh, psychology, basically. Okay, quite, quite wide ranging. Yep, yep. So I've worked with a couple of football teams, I've worked with a couple of Olympic athletes, quite a few Olympic athletes, as well as bread and butter, park runners, and cyclists, and some tennis players. And so yep. at different levels, at uh, adolescents, academies, as well as professions. So Brilliant. Different levels. So. What attracted you to it? To which one? Sports? <laughs> <laughs> Psychotherapy? Psychotherapy? Uh, what attracted you to it? Uh, my mom was a special ed teacher. So I was about 12 or 13, I used to go help her at summer school. Really? Worked with lots of kids that were those, like six, seven years old in summer schools. And I think I just got into it that way. I did my psychology degree at university. Uh, coached football in addition to doing some of my psychology. So I've always played sports and been involved in sports and thought. Now round ball football? Soccer. Soccer. Yes. Okay. Yes. For, like, for, the, for, the, uh, for the Australian. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for the rules. Exactly. Where, where in the world's home for you? Where did you grow up? Uh, grew up in San Francisco. So like, that's English from Malta, so. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Happens, happens, doesn't it? Big San Fran, beautiful part of the world over there. Except it's on fire now. Yeah. Okay. It's like, oh, yeah. Australia and San Fran have got to have that in common in recent times, haven't they? Yeah. Um, so, like, you touched on a little bit there. Psychologist. Psychotherapist. Mm. What's the difference? What's the overlap? Training. Okay, big difference. Yep. So, clinical psychologists would probably study 
anything and everything would, and would be more qualified to probably do more the assessment and psychometric testing. Okay. Mm -hmm. Or psychotherapists would probably specialize in one specific area. So I do cognitive behavioral therapy is my specialism. Someone else that might do gestalt, psychodynamic, or what have you. So clinical psychologists probably would treat lots of different mod uh, modalities, whereas psychotherapists might just specialize in one modality specifically. Okay. So, so you mentioned CBT, cognitive yeah. behavioral therapy. Explain that for us a little bit more. Uh, you know, two seconds. Two seconds. So your thoughts, thoughts, behaviors, and emotions. So if we look at, I always use the example, if I'm waiting, uh, if I'm on my way to work and I'm waiting at the tube station uh, and I'm thinking I'm going to be late for work, my thoughts might go, and if I'm late for work, my boss might not like me. If I'm late for work, my boss might shout at me. Behaviorally, I might look at my watch, mm -hmm. right? But that behavior in itself will reinforce the anxiety I have. Because looking at my watch has no effect on yeah. the train coming. Yeah. 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 Pacing up and down. Exactly. And I start pacing up and down, and then that will reinforce the anxiety again. Yeah. And then I'll look at my emotional states and then any physiological reaction to that. So CBT ties really well into sports psychology. Yeah. And it really will lots of physiological reactions to stressors as well as thoughts. Uh, primarily focused in the here and now, CBT. But an offshoot of CBT, there's sort of things like uh, EMDR, there's things like uh, RMBT, there's other... You're going to have to go into what those are more. <laughs> Schema therapy, there's a cognitive behavior. Lots of things come under CBT, but CBT steals lots of different things from different types of therapy as well. So primarily focused in it here now, but sometimes we might look at how the past might be replicating itself. Okay, so it's not all come in, lie down on the couch, tell me about each other. No, it's, it's a lot more collaborative. It's homework in between sessions, it's getting people to do uh, thought diaries and stuff, recording their thoughts, getting people to do behavioral experiments and things like that. So yeah. Social anxiety might be, I've had patients sing on buses, I've had patients, uh, when you look at OCD, I take pe uh, patients out of, on the underground and drop food on the oh. floor and the food. I would I, literally be going, <laughs> excuse me, sir, you got something? <laughs> I've been on flights with patients, I've taken patients on flights with patients on flight phobias and things like that. London yeah. Zoo to look at rats. And, but where I draw the line is I won't do any uh, phobias with snakes. I hate snakes. Oh. So <laughs> that's where I draw the line. Yeah, CBT therapist. <laughs> <laughs> Pigeons, rats, I'm good, no snakes. As soon as there's no legs, that's it. That's how I draw the line. <laughs> so that's sort of what it is. Yeah, so it's got, I mean, a couple of books I've read in recent times have sort of spoken about that a situation or a stressor doesn't particularly make you stressed. It's, mm -hmm. that it's how you interpret that stress. And I think that feeds perfectly into C CBT, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. So it's really, really quite interesting because I found myself. Since reading the books, think you know some things like you know being late or having to wait for someone, and you start to, <sighs> this, and then it just yeah. takes me a moment to go. Is it really changing yeah. things? Yeah. Like let's just take a couple of breaths, chill out, maybe use this time to do something yeah. else. You know, so yeah, it's 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 quite interesting. So how do you say you treat kind of everyone from kind of. Joe Bloods on the street like myself to that kind of elite athlete. Mm -hmm. So what do you tend to find is the main differences between the two? Uh, I just tend to seem to get common themes. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of the patient group I work would be, say, lawyers and bankers. Mm -hmm. They're generally quite motivated, A-type personalities, mm -hmm. which is often going to be your elite athlete. Mm -hmm. So a similar thing might be getting people to, to focus on rest and recovery. You know, a lot of, a lot of lawyers will come and s s uh, see me and say, how can you make me more efficient? And I would say, you're already working 18 hours a day. Yeah, you're not yeah. sleeping, so we need to focus on, on something else. So generally quite like motivated, driven people. Mm -hmm. um, but then obviously there's, there's another part of the population that, that would have really not the depressed patients uh, and athletes. There are very few similarities. And so turning up to a session on time might be, might be the goal. Might do something as basic as that. So everyone comes in the door. What you get from a referral letter might be very different than what you treat. Right. Because so a referral letter will come from a psychiatrist, say, for a person who suffers with OCD, and you find out they haven't left their house in three months during lockdown or something like that. They haven't left their room. Uh, wow. Just to leave their room to go to the bathroom and come back. So wow. depends on the severity. So you have to be so willing to. <laughs> 
treat everything in, or treat anything in almost every every one, but you can't get too panicked by it. Yeah. I mean, other similarities with, I think elite athletes are so unique um, in sort of what they're presented with and, and that elite sports world that I think is so different from, from day to day world that mm-hmm. personally you might get sort of driven, ambitious people. That's probably where might stop a little bit as well, just given the nature of what what the athletes do as well. Yeah, well, I mean, we certainly know that. And I mean, Helen's worked in quite elite environments with like Cirque du Soleil and mm-hmm. things like yeah, that before. Yeah. And I think sometimes the treatments and what you do with people in that elite environment would be different sometimes than what you would do to normal people just because of the situation of yep. what they have to perform yep. for and, and you know like how many shows a week to serve do? So up to 10, so touring shows will do up to 10 shows a week in in five days. Yeah. It's a lot of load on the body, yeah. Like imagine telling Joe Bloggs to go and do yeah. 10, 10 performances a week of whatever his, his or her exactly. school is. They have to, they come in with a certain skill set, they have to maintain that skill set and put out a certain number of new skills every year too. So they're training new skills at the same time as doing the performances. So I was on the Reno with every week, so that kind of comes with its own set of challenges and its own personality group anyway. Yeah. And then you do really heavy loaded training at the beginning of the week because Wednesday, Thursday tends to be your set up days, well, your one show days. Uh-huh. And then it's quite often two shows, sometimes three shows on a Saturday. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty good. The three shows two, never two a problem. Hour shows. Um, yeah, so it's it's two well, it's, hours. It's about two hours, yeah, with a 25 minute break. Um, kind of, so it's about two hours and 15 minutes. Um, yeah, the three show day is never the problem. It's when you then have to come in early the next day to do load out and two shows that it becomes a problem. Because you might not in Spain get out till one o'clock in the morning and you're back in the arena at 10, 11. It's, awesome. it's um, a perfect example though, isn't it, of dealing with an athlete compared to yeah. a regular person. Yeah. I mean, the interventions might be the same that I would use with a normal person and an athlete. Yeah. Uh, but you're just sort of adjusting them to a, like I'll do lots of, uh, meditation and mindfulness with a normal person and then i'll work with that with an athlete specifically target because i work in track and field but it's getting them to specifically do that in a collar room just before when they're about to go and race yeah amazing so you get them to do some mindfulness meditation because then they're going to go out in 30 minutes and in front of fifty thousand people mm-hmm. so the interventions are the same just when you use them and then trying to adapt them to sports as well yeah so similar intervention okay. just in a different way yeah, and then the, the, the parallels there is the physical yeah. side of things. Mm. It's, it's quite mm. it's the same. It's the same intervention, yeah. just kind of used in different ways. Mm. Really quite interesting. So, sort of kicking on from that, for the therapists listening out there, particularly the physios, um, we work within what we like to term the biopsychosocial model of healthcare. So, once upon a time, it was biomedical, where it was almost looking at the body like a car, and and then all of a sudden we realised, oh, wait a second, there's this thinking, cool. thinking feeling, mm-hmm. human being inside all of that. So we've moved to the biopsychosocial model. And, and I talk to my patients quite a lot about this and how non-physical stresses can have really negative influences on physical stresses or they can combine and cause pain and injury. Mm-hmm. Um, do you see much of that? Do you see much chronic pain and the link between those and... and how do they link up? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I would say first, one of the very first things I'll ask patients when I assess them is how are you sleeping? Yep. I'd say 80% of the patients I see, by the time I see them, they're struggling to sleep or they're on sleeping medication Interesting. or have been on sleeping medication for, for a number of years. Um, so that's one of the first things I want to know. Sleep's like hanging for it, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. exactly. It's exactly. a really good yeah. indication of anxiety. So yeah. what, what counts as kind of a good night's sleep then for you? Uh, pre-pandemic, yeah. patients I work with, okay. six to seven, post-pandemic, okay. seven to eight, pretty standard sort of sleep, I would say. Yep. Uh, most people, a lot of patients I see wouldn't get home until eight or nine o'clock, yep. in an hour or two to decompress. Yep. They may log back on and do half an hour of work at yep. 11 o'clock, <laughs> get to bed by 12. Not that they have kids, don't have kids, where they live, commuting, etc. Yeah. But I'd say people now are probably getting maybe an extra hour of sleep. Well, silver actually, lining of the pandemic, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Um, and I guess the lots of if I think about chronic pain in the body, I would say 
probably 40 percent of all patients I see would have have some sort of pain issues in their body. Okay. Uh, may not have been long term pain issues, but somewhere around what they're going through psychologically, they would have had some some pain issues. Yeah. Um, getting people to acknowledge that there's a link between your depression and your anxiety and what your body is telling you yeah. takes a little bit of work. Mm -hmm. My job is not to convince people of that. My job is to go and say, well, you need to go read about this stuff mm -hmm. and educate yourself. Yeah. Um, so I'm not going to convince you. But what do you tend to direct people to read about that sort of thing? <sighs> Just because I'm really curious, <laughs> I'm going to check it out. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> just uh, just, yeah, just look around and see what's out there. Uh, there's a good John Sarna writes a, a good book called The Mind Body Prescription, which right. where he, he's a chiropractor in New York, and he primarily treats all back issues with psychological uh, interventions. Right. Uh, so the mind body. The mind body prescription. prescription. And he primarily focuses on anger. He says a lot of back issues you do with anger. Mm -hmm. uh, I would find a lot of my angry patients probably anger sits in their shoulders. He, he would say more lower back stuff. Yeah. Um, well, you were talking before about lawyers and bankers, and it's certainly in the city when our city clinics are up and running, we see a lot of that population, yeah. and probably I would say sixty plus percent are insidious onset neck yeah. pain, yeah. shoulder yeah. pain. Yeah. No, no real. Physical, I did this and it hurt, no, no, you know, no, and it no. comes on. And they'll say because I sit so long. Yes. Yeah. But it's quite an, you know, this is obviously generalizing, but it's a relatively aggressive pers uh, sort of um, uh, profession. Like if you're a banker, if you're sitting on the floor, if you're trading shares, it's, it's, you know, it's that Wolf of Wall Street kind of, you know, you see all this activity and it's, it's quite, um, and the city is predominantly male, it's quite a masculine, aggressive mm -hmm. environment. And actually, that's quite similar to sport, where it's quite kind of you've got to do better, you've got to do more, and there's that, that sort of aggression to how much can you mm. get. You don't tend to get many aggressive physios, <laughs> hopefully. Not that I've noticed. I know, I know <laughs> you, but. I know a couple. <laughs> but it, it's, it's the exception. Check yeah. yeah absolutely. And these patients would come and they're working, you know, 14 hour days. And then how they do their sport is exactly like you say, right? They don't just go for a run. They're trying to break their park run times yeah. every Saturday. Every Saturday, yeah. every Saturday <laughs> they're out. You know, they're pushing themselves physically in the same way that they're pushing themselves in the working environments. Yeah. And I see them by the time they, you know, they burnt that basically. They can't cope anymore. So I'll often see the younger ones sort of in their training to two years qualified. Mm -hmm. Uh, and they're thinking, shit, I don't want to come out of this way. Australia, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> they're thinking, I don't want to do this for the rest of my life. Or the people that have been doing it for like eight to ten years and they're thinking, oh, I've got another. I've got to do a whole load more so I can retire. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So in the middle, you don't really see them too much. They're sort of 26 to 35. Don't see them too much. Okay. Maybe they're getting married. Maybe they're sort of. So what are the, what are the mechanisms that the link between why is it that stress can cause pain or why does it increase your risk of injury? What what are the that, like I guess again I'm probably putting a physiological yeah. hat back on here. Yeah. What are the mechanisms there? I mean, I would always look to talk about adrenal fatigue with my patients. Yeah. Because that's going to be a big one. Right? If, you're this, if you're working this hard, you're in this heightened state of anxiety all the time, you're not sleeping, you're exercising quite intensely, something has to give in your body. Yes. Um, other mechanisms that, that I would see would be close. Obviously, relationships are a huge one, which I haven't discussed. Uh, you know, it's, a, it's one of the biggest factors when people come out of addiction treatments as to when they relapse. Is 90% will say relationship issues. Wow. Wow. So that's always a big thing. And if, it, and if, it's, in, if it's in the addiction world, the people are saying it's obviously like the uniform and all this and everywhere else. So I guess for us, talking about that biopsychosocial model, that, that just highlights the social aspect of that yeah. biopsychosocial model. And, and I, I remember being at a conference once and someone talking about this and saying, Actually, psycho the, the the psycho part of that biopsychosocial is the most important because that's what people are immersed in yeah, all, all the time. day. Yeah. It, it's what it's their life. It's it's everything. It's relationships with 
significant others, mothers, yeah. fathers, brothers, you know, yeah. all of these things. So that's I'd say there, there hasn't been one patient that I've worked on over the last however many years that we haven't addressed relationships in some capacity. Ath- athletes as well. Interesting. And with athletes, it's often athletes and coaches. Coaches. And track and field, as, as we know. Yeah. Uh, but it's when someone comes with, you know, a lot of a lot of the patients I see in this world would often be the people pleasers who can't cope in an office environment, who do struggle to be assertive, who are getting bullied, who are not bullied, uh, who are getting dumped with more work because they can't push back. Okay. Because they can't manage these sort of A-type personalities. So, right. so the burned out A-type personalities or the more passive people who can't deal yeah. deal with these with mm-hmm. these people. So where like agreeableness could be quite beneficial for some people in that environment. No, no you just not end so up working three or four hours extra yeah. longer yeah. than anyone else that day. So over a week, you're doing an extra 15 hours of work a week yeah. or something like that. Is part of what you do teach people how to be assertive? Basically, yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Say no to people, uh, speak up in a meeting, disagree with people, argue. Okay. And that's role play. in itself, isn't yeah. it? Because it's, you know, you, you see people disagreeing and, and I'm sure a lot of us watched the last presidential debate. That was mm. fun. <laughs> um, and, okay, so take that. So, so that's obviously two people that are not really listening to each other and not really putting any facts yep. forward because everyone's just sort of doing something but nothing together. Mm-hmm. So how do you go about, if you're in that kind of industry and you are the one getting dumped on, what, what do you, how do you start? Good question. You're like, okay, yeah, real <laughs> assessment. <laughs> well, we'll, start by, we'll start by disagreeing in the session. Mm. I'll ask them to give me their shoes or something. Or ah. give me some money. Just get physically getting them the same now. And when they start oh. untying. <laughs> yeah. They're like, no. <laughs> <laughs> coffee. <laughs> give me two coffees. <laughs> yeah, I'll start eating your cookies. <laughs> so just basic interpersonal skills. It's yeah. such a big part of probably what I do in my work, whether it's anxiety, whether it's depression, whether it's a little bit of PTSD or OCD or whatever, or eating disorders would be a big one, my interpersonal relationships. So that's sort of something we'll def- whether that relates to injury in the body, it will have some effect on the body in some way if you're unable to assert your needs or assert how you feel or say how you feel or any of those, mm-hmm. any of those factors. And this is besides looking at their home lives as well. So there's some layers. There's some layers. There's definitely lots of layers. There lots is, of layers. And pe- lots of layers. Peeling those back is quite, mm-hmm. quite difficult. I mean, from my point of view, we talk a lot about with people about pain and, and things like that. And I guess the hyping up of the nervous system, which you touched on a little bit before, mm-hmm. but that going from rest and digest into fight or flight. Mm-hmm. And we sort of see pain as an alarm. Mm-hmm. It's your body's saying something needs to change here i'm not happy with something and the more in that fight or flight state you are which if you're working 18 hours a day and only Mm -hmm. only sleeping four hours Mm -hmm. and your body's really good at getting into fight or flight so it's more likely to raise that alarm Mm -hmm. um i mean i'll generally assess people the first two two hours of sort of work on doing assessment yep i assume you guys probably wouldn't have that much time to do a full I mean, I have an hour with someone. Um, we take an hour in the studio with people. Um, generally, we zero like forty-five minutes for an initial, thirty minutes for a follow-up, okay. which is quick. It is quick. Yeah. Isn't it? So, how long are your assessment sessions? Fifty, 50 minutes. Well, generally, we go over two sessions. Right. Okay. Go over two sessions. Yeah. yeah. And look at eating disorders and things like that. History of depression and family history and addic- any addiction in the family. Uh, sometimes I might want to speak to a wife of someone or a husband or something like that. Uh, just that what people tell you might be different than the reality of what's happening as well. Uh, so if it's a spousal issue, I'll ask if I can just have to speak to the wife for a one-off session just to get an idea of what is happening at home. People like to elaborate on what is happening. It's nice to sometimes <laughs> see the other person just to see what is right or what isn't right. It's right. Well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that took me a while to figure that one out. <laughs> Tip under the arms, the arms of the arms coming into the field. Do that earlier. Yeah. So we, I guess, I I ask a lot of these questions, and and even now, ten years down the track as a physio, I still, I feel comfortable asking the questions, but sometimes I just don't know what to do with it. Once I get the information, Mm. what the hell do I do with it? Mm. So. And, and we're told to be very cognizant of these things yeah. and, and address these, but sometimes I feel like a fish out of water. 
Like I really do. So mm. at what level is, when, when should we be referring? Mm. Is there any short courses or practical tips you can give to thera- like physiotherapists mm. that if we're thinking those, those psychosocial factors are becoming a bigger issue that we can refer off to or, or tips and yeah. things we can do? As in finding out when would you refer on those? Yeah. I guess that's one part of it. Yeah. Or, I mean, would you ask questions about say eating disorders and things like that? And do you, you have a questionnaire you give to people? So we, no. I have a very in-depth questionnaire for pre and postnatal, yeah. which goes into, um, you know, everything from pain during sex and enjoyment during sex, that sort of stuff. So you can, because you can get a lot of um, kind of ideas out of that. In terms of, oh, he's gone for the cookie. In terms of, um, <laughs> in terms of kind of. Uh, Typical injuries? No, we don't really send out anything. We ask about the typical medical things, and then when somebody comes in, I'll ask about certain bits and pieces. You can, in terms of kind of eating disorders, I would generally only go into it if there was that certain kind of appearance and, and it was clear that they had something before, or if um, I'm seeing a dancer or something like that and they're not getting regular periods and all this sort of stuff, then I'd go into it a little bit more then. Um, You'd ask that in the assessment? Yeah, I would ask that in the assessment. Um, I think I think most physios tend to do everything in person rather mm. than kind of through the questionnaires. Yeah. And actually a lot of the feedback we get about pre- and post questionnaires is why are you asking me so much? Yeah, yeah. They don't, like people tend to not want to put it on paper but they're happy, you know, happier yeah. about yeah. talking about it, yeah. Um, I guess what you'd be, History of obviously injuries are your big, your big one, like reoccurring injuries. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. Time off work. Yep. Have you had periods? Have you had times where you haven't been off work? And what have those been for? Yep. Someone's had two or three months off with anxiety. And that's going to be a good indication. Yeah. Um, what else would we look for? Uh, I mean, sleep, sleep is going to be an obvious one. I always ask about yeah. every every one of my yeah. initial assistants. I ask about sleep. Are you happy? <laughs> On a scale of one to ten, how happy are you with that's, your yeah. life? That's an interesting one, particularly at the moment. Yeah. Where would you say most people sit right now with that? The the patients that were really anxious before COVID are still the pangs patients that are really co- anxious about COVID. Mm-hmm. Patients that are a bit more carefree and have other specific issues are living their lives in a normal mm-hmm. way. So okay. so if I look at my patient list, I say okay, they would be paranoid about this. They'll be paranoid and they'll be the 10 patients I knew who would be as they are now pre and post this. Anxiety doesn't change, it just gets displaced onto something else. Before it might have been my exams or university, now it's COVID. Right. So it just it almost moves sideways. Yeah. It's still the anxiety, it's just another theme. Okay. Yeah, just another theme. Just to round out, going, continuing to go down that pathway. So I guess where I struggle is that I know all, getting all of this information is handy, but sometimes the Confront, not confrontation, but the awkwardness of asking some of these questions because I'm a physio, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? and someone's going to look at me and say, "I'm French. Why the f are you asking me these questions?" Well, we came. I mean, we were speaking about what well, must have been a few a few months ago. Um, we were doing a spinal uh, CPD during lockdown, and um, we asked how many of the guys asked about periods. Mm. The answer is not a single one, mm. and we have. In the group that was in the room, it was predominantly male. It was, and everyone was like, nope, 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 mm. nope. I've been asking since that actually. Okay, well then. <laughs> I have added that to my. So I guess the. So if you ask about periods, yeah. and menstrual cycle, then yeah. we wouldn't ask about mental health. Yeah, but so I guess for me, and I'm not disagreeing with you mm. at all. Um, I can almost, in a way, link a peer, like asking a girl about her period back to physical, a physical, it's a physical thing, so I can link that back to her physical health, whereas that, I guess, mental health is a, taboo is the wrong word, but some, it is awkward for some people to talk about, so just some t- simple tricks, not tricks, questions, ways to breach that. Say, so how do you feel when you're not exercising? Okay. Because obviously you probably see more of the, you often would see the exercise addicts as well, right? Yeah. Of exercise addiction. Yeah. yeah. So how, how does your how does your emotional state when you are exercising or you're not exercising? Say you have gone for a run for a month. Yeah. How have you felt not 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 being able to run? Yeah, and that's a yeah. I feel low. I feel lethargic. I feel so. How then does it affect your life? 
How does this affect your daily moods? How does it affect your relationships, your, your diet, your food, etc., etc.? Some people give you a better, better idea. Well, I'm restricting that because I can't run. Okay, so maybe they're, they're just a bit too preoccupied with, with something like this. Um, what else would I ask? Uh, do you exercise instead of going to social situations? Do you put exercise before work? Do you put exercise before relationships and things of that nature? Um, I think, and I think it also depends on the generation. I think anyone below the age of maybe 30 now, there's so much mental health, there's so much mental health awareness that I think ask the question. Yeah. yeah but I think probably people above Maybe 50, a little bit more uncomfortable with it. The ones in the middle, yeah. I'd be a little bit unsure about, but I think young, young people now are so yeah. in tune with mental health yeah. issues and, and they know so much about mental health. And they would have had two or three friends who probably would have had something if they've been to, if they've gone to university or what have you. It's so common now. Mm. So I would just sort of, if it's a younger person, just ask the question. Just ask. Older person, just be a little bit. Uh, ask a leading question and see where you get to. Yeah. Um, but I think if you, if you tie it in a exercise and how does this affect your mood, how does this affect your functioning, how does it affect your relationships, they'll, they'll give you a little bit of an idea as well. Okay. Um, and I assume also you're seeing what the people that do want to get better as well. Uh, so you just probably see it. You'd be surprised. You would be surprised. A bit like my work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. People come to therapy, but they don't always want to get better yeah. as well. Yeah. Same, same with you. Back at home in Australia, I dealt with a lot of uh, road, well, not so much the road accident people, but work injury people oh, who okay. were off on compensation. Mm -hmm. And there was a, there was a, there was a, a, a element of those people, some of those people, a percentage of them that didn't, didn't want to go back to work. Mm -hmm. And that was, yeah, always an interesting thing. But... That concludes episode 13 of the Complete Health Podcast. Please keep an eye out in coming weeks for the second part of our chat with Donovan about when people's injuries become their identity, setting boundaries in therapy, and strategies for stress relief during rehab when exercise is no longer an option. If you haven't already, please take a look back at our previous podcast series with triathlon expert physio Dan Boyd pelvic health physio Claire Pacey and many more. For another week, stay healthy and goodbye.